All right. Um, welcome to the inviting session of Crypto. Uh, thank you again. It's great to see everybody live. So we're a little bit um, behind time. So uh, um, I'll introduce our uh, invited speaker and uh, uh, he really needs uh, no introduction, uh, but I'll still give one. Um, so uh, many of you probably know uh, a lot of great facts about you, the Lindo. Um, from Baralan University and uh, now at Unbound and Co Coinbase. Um, I'll start with the fact that uh, you probably don't know. Uh, I first met Yuda in the early, I guess, 2000s. We were both visiting IBM, and at that time I was um, known as uh, pretty theoretical, and I thought it's uh, hard to find somebody who is more theoretical than me, and then I met Yuda, and uh, at that time he was working on theoretical foundations of fake, and. Uh, as, you know, you know, clarifying UC definitions, a lot of like definitional subtleties and things. So I said, okay, finally we found somebody who is really theoretical. And at that time I made a lot of predictions, uh, none of them written down. I said, okay, probably uh, he would be a great theoretician. He would uh, write a lot of influential papers uh, uh, on theoretical foundations on cryptography, but I also kind of assumed that uh, he would probably never write a paper at an applied conference, uh, let alone uh, found a company or do a lot of uh, uh, great applied things. And uh, uh, as you can see, um, half of my predictions were correct and half of my predictions were wrong. So he uh, has done amazing work, uh, both as a theoretical cryptographer, but also as an applied cryptographer and also um, as a practitioner, as a person who brings uh, also an educational front and so on. So I'll just list some of you this contribution. So um, he, uh, uh, well, uh, he is a fellow of the ACR, so his citation is for fundamental contributions to theory and practice of secure multi-party computation for sustained educational leaderships and for the service to the ACR. But as I said, it, it doesn't list a lot of his contributions. He um, has uh, written, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, several books, but most notably a book with Jonathan Katz on introduction to cryptography, which is used in many, uh, for, you know, um, in uh, many universities as a textbook in cryptography. Um, he, uh, uh, you know, started Baralan School, you know, Winter School, where again, a lot of educational activities, he graduated uh, uh, a lot of amazing students. Um, uh, but also, uh, I mean, he won, he won Best Paper Awards and CCS uh, 2016, 2017. Uh, he has a Test of Time Award, uh, I think this year, Eurocrypt for um, uh, his work on, um, uh, secure computation, uh, uh, but uh, also well, he uh, co-authored the uh, uh, ITF uh, standard on uh, AES GCM SAV mode of operation, which is also very influential and practical. Um, well, and la last but not the least, of course, he's also uh, uh, became a really, really applied cryptographer with uh, many real world contributions, but uh, in addition to working as industry consultant, um, uh, for several, uh, uh, for, uh, for SafeNet for, for uh, over 10 years, he in 2014 started, became a chief scientist of Unbound, and then later became a CEO of Unbound, and recently, I guess, Unbound was acquired of Coinbase, and in this talk, Yuda will tell us uh, this exciting journey from theory to practice and back. Thank you, Yuda. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, uh, very kind words. So I, I wanna talk uh, today about uh, a journey that I had no expectation that would happen uh, those 20 plus years ago that Evgeny mentioned, uh, revealing our age, uh, from theoretical foundations, uh, and it's, there's a scientific journey, and then there's also a business journey, and I'll try to cover all of that and hopefully give insights that uh, will be of relevance and, and of interest as well. So uh, I want to talk about two, really two separate uh, areas. One is the stages of uh, the scientific evolution of MPC and what we can learn from it. And then what, it, what it, uh, challenges are in commercialization, what challenges we faced, how did we overcome some of them and what still remains a little bit at the end. One thing I just want to start with is I wanted to see, look at the growth of MPC over the years. This is uh, very much a not exact science, but I, uh, put in some uh, main keywords into ePrint, and you can see really that uh, an MPC began in the mid-1980s, mid so you could see that the first 20 or so years, quite flat, but a lot of really foundational, very important work, and at least in, in the way I view it, that's what enabled that massive growth that came, that came uh, afterwards, and now, uh, as uh, someone told me a couple of years ago, uh, MPC is a buzzword. 
And uh, that's a very big change from the time when nobody outside of this room knew what MPC was. Uh, I actually responded to them that I'm not sure if that's a compliment or an insult, but uh, either way, that's the, that's the situation that MPC now is somewhat even a buzzword. So uh, in terms of the scientific evolution, I wanna uh, talk about four stages, an initial idea stage, the theoretical foundations, what I call algorithmic research, and then applied research. And they're actually, in my mind, they're very, very different. And you can see basic uh, timeline there, but it, it, of course it's, it's not true at all, and, and things overlap, and they go back and forth, and, and all of these uh, stages are still going on simultaneously, but there is something about these different stages that lead to each other, which I think is significant. A couple of things, there are some many major counterexamples, like threshold cryptography, which was uh, studied intensively in the 1990s, also from efficiency perspective. Uh, so it's not an exact science. I was CEO for three years, so I can wave hands and not talk uh, uh, um, exact things and feel fine about it. And the second thing is that uh, um, there is so there are so many works to cite, and there are so many people who contributed to this uh, uh, to this uh, process that I'm not going to cite anyone. That way, I, I'll make sure that I won't uh, leave anyone out. At least uh, I hope so. Okay, so. The initial stage, the idea stage, there's this amazing concept that we can take uh, um, distinct parties communicating remotely, and we can actually compute on private data without revealing anything but the results. It's, it's an amazing idea, completely counterintuitive. And we can prove basic feasibility that we can actually do anything, any, any uh, function that you can compute locally, you can actually compute in this distributed and private manner. And not only can you, you can do it computationally, you can even do it information theoretically if you have secure channels. And you can do crazy things like oblivious transfer. I can choose what message to get without you knowing what I chose and with the only, only getting one. And you can do something even more amazing which is OT extension. I can do a number of asymmetric oblivious transfers that are expensive and then with only symmetric operations, I can do many, many, many more. These are incredible ideas, multiplication triples. If I'm able to generate offline triples, sh secret sharing of triples A, B, and C, where C equals A times B, I can now very, very quickly compute a circuit and do online MPC really, really fast. Uh, we can use polynomial secret sharing and multiply polynomials together and do degree reduction. Uh, garbled circuits, of course. We can, we can compile protocols where the adversary is rather mild and benign, semi-honest, into, into malicious. This is an incredible time with, with, with amazing ideas that um, show us the incredible potential of this idea called MPC. And that I think is like the first decade. Of course, there are many amazing ideas afterwards, um, but, but there is a real concentration of these ideas at this time, and, and this list actually has another interesting aspect that I'll get to a bit later on, and, and there are many other ideas at this time, but this specific list all of these things are very much in use in practice today, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So um, what's really quite interesting when you think about it is that these ideas all came about before we even knew how to define security. Yes, people in the early 90s were defining security. There were certainly definitions, but most of those definitions we're not using anymore today, and many of them we look at now and say, no, we don't really think that's a sufficient or a good enough definition. But yet these ideas already came about at that time, and many of them were just right. The protocols themselves, the ideas were so right that when we came up with the appropriate definitions later on, those ideas were actually all good enough and all followed through even when we had these much more stringent modern definitions that we're using today. So there was something about this stage and the people who were around then and doing this um, that they had an amazing intuition uh, that were able to bring ideas that are gonna be relevant 30 years later, even before we really understood what MPC actually means from a definitional perspective. The second uh, observation that I wanna make, which I think is uh, also very, very surprising, is that when we think about theoretical feasibility results and, and these theoretical uh, um, notions, what we're, trying to we're trying to prove a theorem that it's possible, uh, uh, that it's feasible, that you can actually do this. We're not trying to do anything practical. We're not interested in that at this stage. Yet it turns out that a lot of those techniques are what we're actually doing today in practice. 
So yes, we've optimized garble circuits, and we've optimized OT extension, and we generate multiplication triples in different ways and so on and so forth, but all of those ideas are actually what we're using today in practice. And that's really surprising. I, I don't see any reason why we should expect that to be the case. Like I wouldn't have expected that uh, what people uh, design, the way people design protocols to prove a feasibility result would actually be the most efficient way to do things today. And that also comes when you talk about protocols for specific functions. I want to design a protocol for private set intersection versus protocols for you know, generic circuits, right? like Boolean or arithmetic circuits. You would think that, or at least I thought 20 years ago, 15 years ago, without a doubt, that these generic protocols will never be used. What we're interested in is the specific protocols. I want to do ECDSA threshold signing. I'm going to design it specifically for that. I want to do private set intersection. I'm going to design it specifically for that. And that's all actually true. But we actually do use these uh, generic protocols all the time based on circuits. Because if I want to do AES or HMAC, there's no structure for me to rely on. I actually do use this circuit transition. And also, there are many cases where it's uh, both efficient enough and more flexible, so we're actually using these generic circuit methods as well, things that 15 or 20 years ago we thought, no, that would never actually be something that we're going to use in practice. So a lot of surprises also in, in this idea stage and a really, really amazing flourishing time for the beginning of MPC. But at some point, we take a step back and say, okay, but we need to understand what really this is all about. We need to define security. We need to talk about uh, how powerful our adversary is, what the adversary can do and cannot do, what are we assuming. We need to learn how to prove security. We need to develop techniques for how to prove security. And we need to understand under what assumptions we can or cannot achieve these different notions. So this is the theoretical foundation stage where we now we've, we've appreciated the potential of what we can do with MPC, but now we need to take a step back and understand, you know, sort of lay the foundations of the house that was, you know, built very, very quickly, maybe with you know, sort of uh, uh, plaster walls, and now we want to actually build strong foundations and, build the, and, and rebuild the house afterwards. And it's important for me to, to stress, and this is a period that I was around, so I can speak you know, firsthand, uh, we, the motivation was not using uh, MPC to solve a problem. And um, in fact, it was unclear whether it would ever even be used, or whether it would ever be practical enough to be used, and even if, if you look at the papers, you'll say, no, but if I, if I read an MPC paper from uh, 1999, it says in the introduction, it gives me practical motivation. No, but that wasn't the point. The point of the practical motivation in those papers is to say, here is a natural and interesting question that we'd like to solve. And you can see that in the real world, it maps to things that people are interested in. It doesn't mean that because we wrote in the beginning of the paper here, you can you know, design an MPC protocol to learn a decision tree and you could use that to solve some medical problem. It wasn't that we were actually thinking about solving a medical problem because at that time, these things could never even be run in any, in any way, shape, or form. So why did we study it? And the answer is simply because it's about understanding our world. And that's what theoretical research is. And if our world has computation in it, then in the same way that uh, physicists study uh, physics in order to understand our world, then computer scientists study computer science in order to understand our world, so computation is part of it. And these are very elegant and natural questions. And there is a, a, a qu quote that I'm not sure exactly what the quote is and, and who to attribute it, so I won't say, but the natural question needs no motivation. The ability to prove a statement without revealing anything except that it's true is incre it's an incredible notion. I don't need a practical application to zero knowledge proofs in order for it to make it worthy of study. And indeed, we didn't care about, about it, there being a practical application. These were just natural questions to study. And we were doing science. And when you do science, as a community, good things happen. And that's very much the story of MPC. So um, in my mind, and certainly as I started as a pure theoretician, but still see myself as belonging to the, the community, even I'm not sure maybe they've thrown me out now. Um, there are many benefits of theoretical research, understanding our world, as I mentioned. The techniques and the knowledge that we uh, obtain through that study are, is very beneficial. Even just personally, you can actually be a consultant uh, as a theoretical cryptographer because you have an adversarial mindset. When you come to look at something, you think about how to break it. Or if you try to prove it, where the proof fails is where you find an attack. And that actually happened to me 
uh, in practicing in, in, in one specific uh, uh, consulting uh, uh, job. So th there's something just about the techniques and the knowledge that we impart through, through theoretical research, which is very beneficial in practice. But I want to stress, I'm talking about its benefit, benefit to practice, but I don't think it, it, you need it. It's fine and it's beneficial and it's good for the world versus just, just to understand the world, and that's also legitimate. But in MPC, it went much, much beyond that, and MPC became, grew, grew to a practical field out of that, much of that theoretical research. And MPC is not the only example, right? Google search algorithm is based on random walks on, uh, on graphs. So there are many examples, but MPC is certainly one of those examples. Okay, so we've had about a decade or so of this uh, theoretical foundation that's still ongoing, but then we start asking the question, okay, here are these amazing ideas, and we have a good theoretical understanding, but could this ever actually be used? Could we ever actually run an MPC protocol like implement it and run it, and have it actually do something in reasonable enough time that it can be useful. And, and, it's, and it's unclear, because the way protocols were designed then, especially if you're looking at maliciously secure protocols, you'd have to do absurd things like uh, do a car production to an MP-complete problem and prove zero knowledge on that, right? I don't think anybody has actually proven feasibility. They can implement a car production to an MP-complete problem and then run that. Um, or, or use multiple asymmetric operations for every gate in, 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 a, in a big circuit. These are just absurd things. So you would start asking the question, well, can, can, can we maybe do this? And this is a very challenging task because you tend to lose interest from the purists. Because the pure theorists say, well, okay, I know that we can do this. I don't care if it's a little bit more efficient. And the pure uh, practitioners sometimes say, well, you're going from wildly impractical to wildly impractical with a little bit better. Why is that interesting? If it's going to be n to the 5 uh, 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 um, computation or n to the 4, in either case, it's, it's completely impractical. And in, and in fact, uh, this was a, uh, a difficult time for that reason. Fortunately, the community did support. But interestingly, the community supported it was much easier to publish at that time a paper that was improving the efficiency of the general circuit methods than of specific questions, which I don't really have an explanation why, but maybe people felt if you're doing set intersection, and that's a, you know, a practical question, with a, and you want to be more efficient, then if you're wildly inefficient, it's not interesting. But, but there was also a low for MPC at this time, and I remember specifically being on a program committee and being very frustrated because you know, there are very, there are people who, and, and many people here, who are very broad in their research. They research many, many different things. I don't, I do one thing. I know one thing, and now MPC has grown so much, I don't even know that anymore. But um, I, I, I do MPC, that's what I do. And I'm sitting on this program committee, and there's leakage, and there's bilinear maps, and there's lattices. I don't understand this, I don't know anything about it. I, I don't understand the math behind the lattices and the bilinear maps, and, and I'm trying to find papers. You have to vote for what papers you're able to read, and, I'm, and I, you know, I have to like, send to the, the program chair that, that you know, I have hardly any papers that I'm able to read because I just don't know uh, much about all those other things, and MPC is, is not really very popular at this time. And I think there's an important lesson but I, uh, I want to be clear about not taking this too far. So what happens when your field loses popularity and people lose interest? What do you do? So I don't want to be that person that says, everybody here can be the president. No, not everybody can be the president. And not everybody here should just do what they want to do and ignore the rest of the world. So we can't take it to extremes. But I really believe that uh, if you're passionate about your field, then you should continue researching what you're passionate about. So sometimes, you're, you're researching something and it exhausts itself and you really should leave. And sometimes it's a fad and it goes away and you should go and do other things. But sometimes it's not and sometimes you're a lone wolf. But if that's what you enjoy doing, that's what you're passionate about and you do it well, then it's okay and legitimate to continue doing that because firstly it means you'll do better research and secondly, and this is the more important thing, what's important is the community, not the individual. So whether Yehuda Lindell has a successful scientific career is completely unimportant to the world. It just doesn't make any difference. If I have a bad career or a good career, it really doesn't matter. Nothing in the world is going to change because of that. But if we believe 
that our community is doing important things, and if we believe that because we have a digital world and cryptography is really important in a digital world and new directions in cryptography that abstract still resonates today, so if we believe that, then the community succeeding is really important. And therefore, an individual who's doing something different, they may succeed or they may fail, but having multiple individuals doing different things means that as a community, we have a much bigger chance of succeeding. So it's okay to be different, and it's okay to do something which is unpopular sometimes. You have to check yourself. Maybe you really, you know, it has exhausted itself and you should leave, but the fact that other people are doing different things doesn't mean that what you're doing is the wrong thing. And if it is the wrong thing, that's also fine, because in order for us to succeed as a community, we need to have people doing the wrong thing some or even a lot of the time. So I think that's an important lesson that, that we can also take away. Uh, after we have the algorithmic stage, we have the applied research stage. And, and, and here's a difference in both of these stages where make, hold on a second, did I skip the algorithmic stage? Oh, no, I didn't skip the algorithm stage. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So now in the applied research stage, um, the, the, you're still working on making something more efficient, but there's a fundamental difference. In the algorithmic stage, the focus is on the MPC. I want to make my uh, MPC protocol, my cryptographic protocol, I want to make it better. I want to introduce new techniques. I want to do new things. In the applied research stage, the focus is no longer on the techniques but on the problem that I want to solve. So if we look at a paper in 2001 that's called Privacy Preserving Data Mining and shows how you can do two-party secure computation semi-honest of decision tree learning, and if you look in 2021, and just use that number to be 20 years later, uh, at people doing uh, privacy preserving machine learning, they're completely different papers, but if you read the introduction, it's a bit subtle. Because in 2001, although it's talking about privacy-preserving machine learning, it's, the statement of the paper is MPC has the potential to actually solve these types of more complex problems. But no one really cares about the problem. We're not trying to do decision tree learning in practice. In 2021, we actually are. We want to solve a real problem, and the MPC becomes a tool to solve that problem, and the focus is actually on solving the problem and not on the, on, not on the cryptographic uh, a core, but even of course when we do that, we, we uh, do do new cryptography and we do add new techniques, but the focus is very, very different and that's why I differentiate between the algorithmic research type papers or stage and the applied research. I think they're very different. And, and of course all of this mixes up because then you get nice new theoretical questions when you're studying these, these problems as well and, and everything interacts uh, uh, very, very nicely. But at some point, we've done all of this work, and the science becomes what we call technology, or becomes something that we can actually apply in practice. And, um, and then what do we do? It's actually ready for commercialization. And the tendency of many researchers, and including very much myself, is to wave to industry and say, hello, look over here, look, we have this wonderful, wonderful thing that we've built, take it. You can solve lots of really good problems, go, use it. Uh, it's really nice, but it's never going to happen. And the reason why it's not going to happen, there are two reasons why. Two reasons why it's not going to happen. The first reason why it's not going to happen is because they actually don't know about it. So maybe we can try to be better at communicating, and maybe we should write more in Scientific American, and maybe we should try to write more popular science. But, but people in the industry just don't know about it. They're not going to know about it. But the more fundamental, the, the deeper reason, or, or the more acute reason is that in the early stages of commercialization, these scientific tools require huge expertise to deploy. So we all know that deploying cryptography is hard anyway. Getting someone to encrypt with AES properly is hard. But if you've taken an undergrad course in cryptography, there's a good chance you'll be able to do it. You don't need more than that. But, um, but with MPC, it's far from it, especially in the early commercialization stage, and even today as well. It's far from that, and it needs great expertise. If we're not willing to do that, it's not going to happen. People in industry are not able to even, even if they wanted to, even if they knew about it, they're just not able to come and take it and to start using it themselves without us being involved. Now, some researchers actively look to do it. They want to have a startup. For many years, people would say, we've got any research. Don't you have any startups you want to do? They leave me alone. 
I'm a happy academic, I like doing research, uh, I, I like my life, I'm not interested. Um, that sort of went away at some point because I had an idea that I felt I couldn't ignore. The idea was a very simple one, which was that if we can split keys, it's the threshold signing or threshold cryptography idea, but in a more modern perspective, if we can split keys into multiple places and have strong separation between those pieces, then we can protect keys in software and have many, many advantages over what's currently done in the world to protect keys. Um, I felt I couldn't ignore it. It also was somewhat a natural progression. If I started doing pure theory and then was involved in algorithmic research and then in applied research, this was sort of like a, a natural progression. It also takes a lot of commitment. Luckily, I didn't know how much because otherwise I'd, it's very possible I wouldn't have even uh, ever started. But it doesn't matter, uh, uh, s s like what I talked about before for the community, not everybody has to do it. Um, and it's good for the people who want to do it to be the ones who do it. But the fact that we have some people doing it and some people not doing it uh, means that we get this healthy community where different people are doing different things and then as a community again, we succeed. So what are some of the challenges of the early days? Well, what is MPC? It sounds like snake oil because it doesn't really sound possible. And we actually had people, we had one meeting and someone from, I think it was Oracle said that he just doesn't believe us. Like, you're lying, it just doesn't make any sense. This is snake oil, go, go away. Um, many of the people have just never heard of it. They just never ever heard of this thing. So you're doing something brand new with something that I've never heard of. Um, what, you know, is it legitimate? It's a, it's a real problem. So, so what do you do? How do you overcome this? So actually, to my great surprise, uh, academic reputation actually helps. So writing a textbook actually probably helped my company a lot more than many, many other things that I did because there were these multiple times you're in a meeting, you're in a meeting with business people and technical people, and someone, one of those people, uh, uh, one of those uh, 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 people on the technical side studied cryptography in university and used your book. And suddenly it's a different, completely different discussion because you have credibility. Or people can look you up and see that you, you published many papers, you're a serious researcher, and, and therefore we should listen to you and not immediately dismiss you as another obvious uh, snake oil uh, salesperson. Um, this also means that it's really important to keep that reputation. So when the marketing people in my company said, we would like your LinkedIn credentials so we can post for you, I said, no, not happening, never, never, ever, ever. Um, market ed education. We need to educate the market about this new, new thing that we're doing, and that means that when you're building a startup based, which is based on new technology or deep technology, it's going to take longer. It's gonna take a long time, and in fact, uh, if people know this, but the average, the median time to exit, and exit I mean, or acquisition or IPO, the median time to, to exit for a startup company is eight years. So when you're building a startup based on, um, Deep technology, can, you can expect for it to take longer. In our case, it, it ended up taking seven years, so we're just below, but, but it makes sense that it takes longer because the, the initial years are, you have to do a lot of market education. That's speaking and writing blogs and writing white papers and communicating with the community. And, and when you're involved, you, you, you involve customers and, and you have people at that customer who have become aware, they move around. That's also why you very much, in a startup company, you try to have focus in a specific, what they call a vertical, a, a, an industry, because people move around in that industry. So you've educated one person in one place, they move to another company, now you suddenly have another company who's aware of what you're doing, and, and so on and so forth. A FIP certification, it's actually really, really important. It helped us a huge amount. We had a, a, a customer, over a million dollar a year customer, who we said, we're getting FIPS like in, in a couple of, in a, very soon, in a month or two, we're getting it, uh, so you know, and that was really significant for them, especially because we had level two and not just level one. But they withheld the second half of the payment, they paid half, and the second half they wouldn't pay until we got the certification. So this actually is an important signal for the industry, and people in, in, in this room, and myself in the past, I admit as well, would say, well, you know, how, how serious really is crypt certification? I mean, if you have you know, bugs in the software, it's not gonna catch it. It's, you know, are these things really important? The answer is actually they are, because there's a lot of noise out there. How does a customer who wants to buy a cryptographic product know that they're not buying complete and utter garbage? It's very, very challenging, at least if they know 
that you're using standard cryptography and standard methods, and it's undergone some, uh, some uh, significant or real scrutiny that helps them a lot in making that decision. Uh, in Unbound, we, it was very important for us to support the entire cryptographic API, the standard one. So we did MPC for ECDSA, RSA, uh, um, AES with the different standard modes of encryption, HMAC, and so on and so forth, because we, it was really important that we're just supporting the standard crypto, cryptographic API, and then we can get FIP certification for that, and that was very significant for our customers. Um, the, the NIST people here afterwards, those, I can take a few envelopes. Um, <laughs> There's something else, Gartner. Gartner is like this market analyst that, that they look at the world and they look at different technologies and companies. And they actually also really help a lot, but this really grates you in the beginning. It's like really outrageous. Like we have thousands of scientific papers published in top tier conferences and journals. And what you want is this Gartner analyst to come and tell you that MPC is a legitimate thing. I mean, really? But again, you have to understand the world is a very noisy world. There's a lot of fake news, a lot of vendors selling complete garbage, uh, lying through the teeth about what they're doing, and people need things to help them clear up that noise, and Gartner is one of those things. They have this thing called a hype cycle, and, and where they talk about different technologies. I won't go into it, but actually this turns out to also be something very important to engage in those analysts as part of your market education, because they help a lot. Okay, so now you've, we, we, we've decided we're gonna do this, um, we have the technology and we have to decide what problems are we solving. And, and here there's a, a, a very challenging first step, which is to move from doing projects to building products. Today, and there are companies that are doing this, uh, you can build a successful consulting company building one-off solutions, projects for, uh, with MPC for different people who need different things but you can't scale in that way. You can't build a viable, scalable business where you build one piece of software and sell it to many, many companies and get that exponential growth. I'm still enough of a scientist, when I say exponential, I actually mean that. I don't mean a lot, like uh, other people use it. It's actually doubling each year for five, five years or something like that. You can't do that without a scalable product, and that means that you need to find something that many, many people want. Now, um, our focus at Unbound was on key management and, 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 and key protection, and the advantage of that is this is an existing problem with an existing budget, and people understand they need solutions for that. They don't understand that they need ours, but they need solutions for that. Uh, when you're going to even new areas like privacy, using MPC to solve privacy, this is really uncharted waters, and it takes time to find problems that many, many different customers have and you, can, you have to be careful not to be fooled by your first one or two customers because they can actually be the exception and not the rule. So finding something that, a problem that many people want to solve is, is a really, really critical thing to do. And also finding what we call a repeatable use case, something that, again, many people are going to use the same thing. And we often get confused, what is a use case? And we think, oh, cryptographic key protection. No, that's not a use case. Cryptographic key protection is an application, but what am I protecting? or better machine learning for image analysis. That's not a use case, that's technology. A use case is replacing smart cards uh, uh, for user authentication by using MPC between a mobile, mobile and a server. Uh, or using uh, MPC for, or, or you know, using key protection for code signing. That's an application. That's a, sorry, that's a use case. And you need many people with the same use case in order to, again, grow that viable uh, business. And when you have repeatability, you understand what problem your customers are trying to solve, you can market to them, you can train your salespeople about the specific application people are interested in, you can educate the market because you know who you're talking to because you know what problems they're trying to solve. And these are all very, very difficult problems to solve. And often what happens, especially in the early days, is that we fall into the trap and mistake of talking about technology. It's very natural for us because we're technologists, we love technology, and often we don't like business that much. So uh, we talk about the technology, but it's really important to understand that a company with the best technology but poor business execution will lose to companies that have poor technology and better business execution. It's not good enough to have good technology. And in fact, 
uh, it's really important to get to a stage where you're not talking about the technology anymore. The technology is a means to an end. The end is to solve a problem, a business problem that your customers have. Your technology is just the way that you do it, but no one cares about your technology. Or if they do care, then you should be very careful and wary, because that means that there are technologists who are gonna say this is really cool, but you'll never sell an actual product to them. Okay, so the reason why this is hard for us is because what makes our product better? The technology. So if we don't talk about the technology, then what differentiates us from our customers? And that tendency actually, it takes, it, it really requires a lot of training and understanding about, again, what business problem we're solving to get, move away from the stage of talking about a technology. And here as cryptographers, we have a problem because most of our solutions are invisible. If I'm selling anomaly detection, what I do is I walk into my customer and I say, uh, I'm a potential customer, I say, listen, I'll run a scan on your network and let me see what, what malware I catch that your existing systems don't, uh, haven't caught. And I can do that. I can actually demonstrate clearly that I'm doing something that, uh, or that I'm better than what you have now. When I'm encrypting in one way or another, I'm providing privacy, I'm preventing, I'm claiming that I can prevent somebody from carrying out an attack. How much is that actually worth? People want to understand what they call the ROI, the return on investment. If I'm gonna buy a product for $200,000, I wanna understand how much is that actually, is that gonna be worthwhile for me? Because security is, is in many cases, not in all cases, not in national security, but in, in, in the business world, it's interesting as long as it saves me money. And if I can improve security of credit cards, but the amount that it will cost is more than I lose every year on fraud, then it's not worth my while. As a credit card company, I don't care if people steal $10 million from me, as long as, long as I'm making uh, uh, you know, enough more than that, that, that I still have my, my, my profit margin. But when you're doing, again, cryptography, it's very hard to put your finger on actually how much is this worth. And being secure in an unclear, being more secure doesn't really say very much, and it's very hard for people to actually uh, um, understand if they should buy or not. So how do we overcome this challenge? And there are, there are a number of things, but two main things I wanna focus on is one is finding what you call your value proposition. So what actual value is my product bringing to my customers? And again, as you can guess, saying you're more secure in some vague way is going to be difficult. Uh, not for everyone, some customers will buy based on it being better security, but at scale, much harder. And the second is determining what we call the compelling event. The compelling event is if you want to buy something, what makes me buy it now? Okay, so your kid yelling in the store that they want this right now, maybe it's a compelling event as a parent. But as a business, I have to understand like, okay, so this, this, this we had many times, this is really cool technology, this is much better than we use now. This is much better than our physical HSMs. Uh, I, I love this product. But why should I buy it right now? They don't say that, but they don't buy. And you don't really understand why. And the reason is there's no compelling event. There's nothing forcing them to buy it right now. So it gets pushed off as a project. This is something you put on the side as a great thing to do. It's like those papers that you always wanted to read. Okay, so in terms of value proposition, for us at Unbound, it was very much actually not what we thought. We started with, okay, we have physical HSMs, hardware security modules, and there are smart cards. Hardware is a pain. Most of our, I hope there, you know, if there are HSM vendors here, please don't hate me, but most people hate their HSMs. And we said, okay, so if we uh, do this in software, it's gonna be cheaper, it's gonna be faster to deploy, more agile. Um, so that's, that's, our, that's our value proposition. It, it didn't actually really work very well because it wasn't enough and there was no compelling event just by being, you know, I already have the hardware. I hate it, but it works, right? So you, you hate your fridge, you hate it, it's really annoying, or you hate your TV. It doesn't mean you buy a new TV tomorrow, right? You, you, it's not enough to not like you, you need some reason to actually replace it. And in the end, actually, our value proposition was very, very different and it was very much about usability uh, what we call orchestration defragmentation, I'll explain a bit later on. And MPC was an important part of that story, 
but it was very much under the hood. It was the fact that you could do something purely in software enabled us to do many, many interesting things. So all that needed to be was software. Okay, then you ask the question, but if it's software, it's not really secure because you have the key on a machine. Okay, that we solved by doing MPC. But what's really important about the solution is just that it's software. So if I can give you security in software, then I can suddenly do very interesting things that are important to you in terms of usability. Um, and there was something else that, that was true on the security side, and it's not true that people don't buy for security, they do as well, and that is that we understood that we can solve something that other people haven't solved, and that's what, what I, we called key misuse resistance. So legacy key protection was about preventing someone from stealing the key. I have a database of 10 million encrypted credit cards. I don't want someone to steal that encrypted database and the key and decrypt everything at home. If they could interact online and ask for 10,000 decryptions overnight, I don't care. Losing 10,000 credit cards, I don't care. Losing 10 million, I care about much, much more. Um, but, if, but there are cases, and two very significant cases are cryptocurrencies and code signing, it's sometimes enough to have one, one fraudulent signature, one fraudulent operation, and it's game over. I just need one fraudulent signature on an iOS update to now turn millions of iPhones into uh, malicious devices. It's enough to have one malicious signature on the banking app that I can now deploy a fraudulent banking app and steal lots of people's money. In cryptocurrency, if I'm, present, if I'm pr protecting $100 million with a key, it's enough to have one signature. I don't need to steal the key. I just need to interact with the system. And with MPC, you can split the key into num a number of places, and including people, and you can have each of those different machines verify policy and even maybe have humans look at it and verify that cryptographically so you can't bypass all of those checks and then get to the single machine that issues the request to sign. And it turns out that was very significant. For example, in code signing, we had one customer who, what we were doing, that they were very excited about it, uh, had actually asked us for what we were already building, which is a good sign, is that each MPC participant would run a malware scan on the code before they would agree to participate in the MPC protocol. This is something that becomes much, much harder to bypass. Bob Blakely, who was one of our uh, investors at Citibank, uh, uh, said the following thing, and this is a really, really important uh, uh, saying, at least it was for us. It's always easier to sell a product that improves usability without sacrificing security than it is to sell a product that improves security without sacrificing his ability. And that may be sad for many of us in this room. What do you mean? I'm giving you better security, don't you want that? Yes, I want that, but I can't measure it. It's always best if you improve both, right? As security people want to improve security, but in order for people to buy it, I have to improve usability, because usability they can measure. Oh, I can onboard customers much faster. Oh, uh, if someone loses their credentials, I can fix that much more easily, I can save money. Oh, the number of people I need to administer this infrastructure is much lower, I can save money. I can move to the cloud more easily because it's more agile. These are things that people understand and can measure and they will therefore buy. And if we have security products that do that as well, then people will also buy those security products more and, and, and then that's a win-win for, for all of us. So what about the compelling event? event? Why should I buy now? So people often look at regular compliance as something which they don't like. I think it's a... It's very important for, for the security world. It's very important for people who want to sell security because that's often the reason why people buy. I want to, GDPR forces me to encrypt. I want to move to the cloud and I need to encrypt either because there's regular compliance externally or because my internal security team says that I have to. So these are, it becomes, security becomes a business enabler. The fact that I can enable you to do something more efficiently, more easily, means that I can actually do business and now I can measure how much this is worth for me. Immediate cost savings, of course, also help, but the immediate is really important because if I can show you that you need to replace your entire infrastructure and in three or four years' time you're gonna save money, you say, that's very nice, but what do I do for the next three or four years? Um, understanding the compelling event is also important, like I talked about beforehand, because now I can talk to my customer about the problems they have and the reason why they should be buying. And if I don't understand why they're going to buy, I can't do that and that also becomes difficult. So I wanna go through just a few slides of what we ended up with and con contrast it to what we had in the beginning just to try to demonstrate this. And I'm gonna do it really, really quickly. 
So today's cryptographic infrastructure is all fragmented. There are different environments. I have keys in data centers and in clouds, and uh, I need to migrate things. And there are different uh, keys, I have physical HSMs and cloud HSMs and cloud key management systems and, and uh, um, different interfaces. When I talk to my H, when I talk to my keys, I need to use. There are different libraries that are supported, and I have to manage them all different. And it's a huge mess, and, 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 and we're crying every day at work. And I have management problems and c consumption problems, and, 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 and I want to kill myself. So uh, what, what do I need to do? Uh, I want to give you unified orchestration. I want to tell you that you can manage all of your keys in all of your key, key stores in, from one place. And you can consume cryptography in a unified way. So you'll talk via one system, and that will translate to all these archaic uh, machines and things that you have everywhere. Uh, so it's really about working in a more in a more efficient manner. And, and then, you know, this is, this is the world that could be. You can have this, what we call unbound core, and you have a virtual HSM that you can use to talk in a unified manner uh, to whatever key store. At the bottom here, you have, you know, cloud key stores and physical HSMs and the unbound MPC key store and maybe secure enclaves. And you have different applications on top, and everything can work by this unified world that's all pretty and nice, and, 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 and we have good graphic designers to do it. And, and, and you should know that you know, when you're using software, you should feel OK, because we have this thing called MPC, and we have FIPS level 2 certified. But look at the benefits. The benefits don't talk about our cool protocols. They talk about supporting cloud migration and cryptography at the edge, where your protocol, where your application actually runs, it's more efficient. Built-in high availability and disaster recovery, because of software, you don't have to worry about having multiple HSMs now in different data centers around the world. Uh, it's fully virtualized, and it's also more secure. Okay, that, that just, and you, can, you might be rolling your eyes and saying, well, he's really become a marketing person, get this, this person off stage. Uh, um, but, but actually, if you want people to buy your product, this is the language you need to talk, talk to them with because, and if it's true, it's fine. Okay, it's okay to, to, to talk marketing speak if it's true. It's less okay when it's not, at least in my opinion. But let's contrast this to what we started with. This is the way we started. These are four slides. At the top, we start talking about we have technology based on so strong scientific roots using secure multi-party computation. Here, there's a real problem in the data, the, the data security center challenge. There are attackers everywhere, and they're breaching our networks. And the challenge isn't being met because there are all of these breaches. And look here, we have this really cool thing where we can connect a database to two machines that will talk to each other. And this just, it's all about the technology. Now, people who, the first slide is completely irrelevant for customers, who cares? The second slide, either you understand that you're being breached and you're looking for a solution that I have to tell you, or you don't understand and me telling you won't help. So we gave up very early on trying to educate our customers to be more secure. Either you're already aware of it and then we'll provide a solution, or you're not relevant for us. That's not true for all products. We were a more high-end security product, but that's typically the case with, with newer technology. And, and the, the last slide is, oh, yeah, OK, but, but that's not the point. What value are you going to bring? Uh, and that's not the value at all. So there's much more I could talk about, uh, things like what's called product market fit and focus, um, being a researcher and a co-founder and a lot of dilemmas that are there, uh, but I just don't have time. Uh, so I do want to talk a, a little bit about what we still have to achieve before I conclude and take questions. So firstly, we should be aware that although we have commercialization successes, we're still very, very early in the game. And we still have a long way to go. Industry knows about us. MPC, a lot of people know it is. But still, there are many, many more who need to. And the more industry knows, the more they'll come with the relevant use cases. It's very hard for us to know what people's real problems are without being there. That's why, by the way, as an academic, consulting is a good thing. It's a very good thing to consult because you understand what problems people are actually trying to solve. Um, but all of this, in my, at least in my mind, will remain limited because as long as MPC requires great expertise to deploy, there's just a limit in the bandwidth of people who can actually go ahead and do it. So either what happens is you have really, really bad MPC solutions out there, or it's just enough bandwidth, and therefore it doesn't really grow. So as a community, one of the big challenges is for us to make MPC an off-the-shelf product, something that I can, it's not going to be like using STL data structures, fine. But can we make it 
as hard or easy to use, whatever you want to call it, as authenticated encryption or TLS. That's where we have to go, and it's very hard even to define what that means. But um, as long as we need a PhD in cryptography, actually today you need a PhD in NPC. PhD in cryptography also probably isn't enough. Um, that's, uh, as long as we need that, that's a, a significant barrier to mass adoption. So that's a, a call out for, for here. So important, some important lessons that I think we can take away. Science is a process, and it's a process that we as a community uh, go through. And it can take a long time to become technology, but that's fine. Our, our goal, at least in my opinion, our, our role in, in, in this community is to solve problems for 10, 20 years' time. The problems companies are having now, they can solve. That's not our problem so much. It's not, we can always earn some extra money by helping them, but, but it's not our academic role. Our academic role is to solve problems for the future, and we do that, I, I believe, we do that very, very well. Uh, we don't know what we're working on today. We have no idea which papers in this uh, conference are going to be uh, important. Sometime, sometimes you have papers which are completely unimportant, but their techniques, like in terms of what they're solving, but the techniques in so, inside suddenly become very relevant in, in other places, and we never actually know. And I think a really good thing is that today, especially looking today versus 20 years ago, the interaction between academia and industry is... Um, extremely um, active, there's, there's a lot of interaction, people go back and forth, people talk to each other. Uh, th these, these are very, very positive things and I think it shows a huge success uh, that we have as a community. So I wanna end by saying thank you, and maybe it's a bit exceptional to say this, but I, I really believe that I uh, owe a debt of gratitude to this community. I think it's a really friendly and supportive community. I remember as a young graduate student, it's very senior people, uh, coming up to me after my talk and telling me, giving me good feedback, people helping each other, people s sincerely being excited at other people's work. Uh, this is a really, really great community and we should appreciate it, and, and, and I do, and I, I want to thank you all for inviting me and, and, and for uh, all the years of joint work together. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yura, for a fascinating talk. Um, I'll start with one question, but if uh, there are, you know, I don't, we'll probably will not be able to take all the questions, but people can come to the mic. So I guess one question is really two dual questions. So you said it's very useful for academicians to, uh, for academics to be involved in consulting and hopefully the other way around for applied or for companies interested in cryptography to employ academics. What's your advice in both directions if an academic what can you do proactively so that people contact you or you contact companies or the other way around for companies how to um, get better engagement with academics? It's kind of I, I don't have any, I, I don't know. Uh, it's sometimes luck, it's sometimes just being out there and, and I think the active interaction that's happening today makes it work, but I, 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 don't, I don't think I have any tips. I, I do think that companies who um, do cryptography, it's extremely important that there are real cryptographers in those companies. I think it's happening much more today. 20 years ago, I, it wasn't the case. 20 years ago, I know of a number of companies that did a lot of cryptography and said, oh, we don't need a, any, we don't need a cryptographer because we're doing just you know, basic things, and, and they were not. So I think on that side, companies really need to, to make sure they have uh, uh, people who can do it. And from our side, and luck, I guess. Yes. All right, thank you. Mike? It's not on. Uh, oh. The mic there is. The mic isn't working for Mike. Oh, yeah, maybe also, I don't know. Yeah. I just did a dad joke. If the question is short, you can, I guess, uh, repeat it for Zoom people. But Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Yehuda. Uh, I'm wondering if you have discussions with people in industry about like semi-honest, malicious, UC standalone, are these things important to them? Do you just say, hey, I wrote the textbook so you can trust me? And like, what, no, what, what can I, that, how can that inform us as, as researchers? No, so I, I really think that just, just before I answer the first question, the, the, the second you know, sort of quip, I think it's really important that we don't say things like just trust us because we're, and, and transparency is really important. It's actually quite easy for us because as a community we believe in transparency. And it's not the industry norm. So 
we, it was very important for us. We were very transparent, and in fact, sometimes salespeople got mad at me because I would even point out like some of the weaknesses of our solution. Like here is what's really good, but this actually is, you know, be aware that this is, you know, not ideal. You have to be careful about that. And I would sort of like frown, but but the customers actually appreciated it, and it was so sort of full transparency and explaining it. I do think that 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 customers care, especially in what we were doing, that it's maliciously secure. Uh, absolutely, and we will talk about that. Uh, because if you're talking about a case where somebody takes over a machine, then if they take over a machine, they take over a machine. Uh, does it mean they go into the nuances of UC security or not? It depends. We had one customer who, a uh, very big customer, I can't say their name, who engaged with uh, a prominent university in Europe where they had uh, three or four cryptographers who, who did a very big job of going through everything and then they, so they wrote a report where they related to all of those things. So, so it depends. Uh, it depends, but we were always very happy to do what we call a deep dive, uh, very happy to always, uh, uh, we would always hope that on the other side there'd be a cryptographer, and sometimes there were. Um, but I think that yes, explaining the, uh, showing that you're willing to explain everything and having materials that have all of those details is, is actually is very important. And often what happens is when you show that level of transparency, then they say, okay, don't want to trust you. It's when you don't want to show the level of transparency that they don't. Naida? I was wondering if you could uh, do the little exposition that you had on balancing being a co-founder and a researcher that you skipped over. Okay, so, uh, so a, couple of, uh, a couple of things that I, I would like to say. Number one is that as a scientist, we have a lot of respect for fields of expertise. And this is a bad thing. Because what happens is that I started in the first four years, I was chief scientist. And every time, but I was co-founder. So every time I was asked a question which related to business, I would say, oh, I don't know. But you have to give an opinion, and, and then I would just throw something out. Because I don't know, it's not my field of expertise. I know MPC, I don't know anything else. I don't know about lattices, and they're asking about business. Uh, uh, and, and actually, it's a huge mistake. As a founder and, and as a researcher who understands the technology, it's really important to make the effort to understand the business problems that we're trying to solve and what we can and cannot do. And, the, and as researchers, actually, we have a lot of our thought processes, uh, the rigorous way that we uh, um, go through and uh, um, research a problem and understand it and apply logical reasoning. These are all things that are actually are very beneficial. We just have to be not afraid to do that. And often we are, because we're intimidated by this person who's the CEO and he's, you know, he or she has done multiple companies and, and they know all about business and we don't know anything. It doesn't mean that we should be arrogant and say that we know everything, we don't. In fact, one of our advantages is that we obviously don't know, so we, we take the effort to listen and to study and learn. I think that's one of the, that's a really important thing. The second thing I'll say is that doing both is an absolute nightmare. Uh, uh, it was, my life was much worse when I was half-time in university and half-time as chief scientist than when I was full-time CEO, which is amazing, because CEO of a startup is, is. so uh, um, uh, doing both is really, really hard. And that's what I talked about, the commitment. It requires a lot of commitment. It doesn't mean you can't. And people shouldn't say, well, if I can't, if I'm not gonna, I, I wanna stay in university, I shouldn't found a company. It's just to be aware that if you're really a founder and not just sitting from afar and throwing cryptographic ideas to the team, but you're actually really a, fan, a founder, it it's, uh, requires a lot of commitment. Um, but just like when you have a really, really hard research problem that at the end succeeds, there's a great re personal reward. Uh, here too, uh, it's, it's, it's similar, uh, but somewhat more lucrative. Uh, okay, Daniel, maybe we'll take a couple of more, but. Okay. Hi, Yehuda, thank you so much. So just a quick question. Uh, we know that we can get more practicality if we introduce assumptions like honest majority and non-collusion and so on. I wonder how you will motivate these assumptions in practical settings. So one thing which I, I think is really important is that there is no answer. And many, many, very often you'll hear people who say things like, in practice, that's not important, or in practice, this is what you need. And maybe it's true of their experience, but there are many, many different applications, and there are many, many different settings. And it's true that there are in some settings it's not important, and in some settings it is important. One of the things about startups is that you're doing something brand new. So there is no rule book. There is no cookbook and there is no, there are no, there's no clear answers. It depends on the application. And if for that application it makes sense and it's good enough and people are happy with it, then you know it's good enough. 
And if it doesn't make sense, then it, then it doesn't. But you don't really, you can't really know without understanding what the problem is that people are trying to solve. What threats are they concerned about? What threats are they less concerned about? So what, what, what is your application domain? Is the main motivation security or is the main motivation compliance? Uh, so there is no answer. I, I apologize for, for answering that like a politician. It's okay. Thank you so much. I guess Alison's the last one. Uh, yes, I just want to ask one of the questions that came in on Zoom. Oh, but, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, one quick announcement, the REMP session submission deadline is tonight at 5 p.m., uh, so please get those in. Uh, here's a question from our Zoom audience. How do you foresee MPC solutions in a decade compared to hardware-based trusted execution environments? Ooh, okay. So, um, I think that if trusted execution environments actually end up being built on completely isolated, separate chips, then maybe there's hope for them. Currently, the experience of trying to combine in the one processor has been a very big failure in my mind. It doesn't mean it can't be used. I think there's a primary security solution. It's not good enough. I think that, that trusted computing or secure enclaves or whatever as a secondary solution is, secondary level is, is, is helpful, but I don't think it's secure enough. Um, there's always a challenge with hardware in, of, of, you know, again, if the world is such that, and this is something that we often do as scientists, right? We say, um, like, let's say, I'll give you a different example. So I said that, you know, that with MPC, we can do this policy verification in different places. Very often as a scientist, you start thinking, one second, but the HSM vendors can also just do that. They can put inside the HSM, they can put a policy check in. And what's the answer? But they haven't. And that's the truth. It's not just what you can do, it's what actually is in products, what options the customers actually have to use. So will it be a world where there's this one secure execution environment which is actually easy to use and is actually truly secure and is actually deployed worldwide and everybody has access to the same thing? Yeah, that's what we call in cryptography the ideal world. So, you know, I don't... Will, will it actually, I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm, I'm not good at prophecies, uh, um, but I, I think that MPC will have a place. It's always going to be more flexible than hardware. Uh, it's going to not be vulnerable to what we call a single point of failure or a single point of compromise. Uh, so I think that it has a lot of potential irrespective of, uh, of trusted uh, execution environment. What I like the most is to run your MPC protocol inside a trusted execution environment. So even if someone gets to one of the machines, they don't get the secrets. They don't have to break that enclave as well. I think that's a, that's, that's a very, very nice model, at least in my opinion. All right, great. Well, let, let's thank Yuri again, and uh, hopefully. Thank you very much.